Here. 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 First item on the agenda this evening is a presentation of the Highway 141 corridor study. Good evening. By way of brief introduction, um, we have been working with the City of Grimes, Polk County, Iowa DOT over the last number of months on a long-term corridor study of the Highway 141 corridor between Highway 44 and Highway 415 or Sailorville Drive. Uh, Mark Parrington will be with us here tonight to give a brief overview of that um, of that study. So I'm going to turn it over to Mark. Evening, Mayor, Council Members, uh, Mark Parrington, Snyder and Associates, Ankeny, Iowa. I'd like to give you just a really quick summary of where we're at with the study and uh, try to answer any questions for you if I can after that. Cindy, the screen in front of us is not on. Is oh, they're getting the screen. Um, to remind, to remind all of you, real quick, you know, the, the goal of this was this partnership effort to try to analyze the corridor from the forty-four interchange out on the west side of Johnston Grimes up to the Iowa four fifteen interchange, you know, roadway leading to the mile long bridge. So that's essentially our corridor. Go ahead. The main thing we were trying to do with this was look at traffic growth over time, crash history, safety is always a very important part of what we're trying to do. And uh, above all else with the land use plans, uh, Grimes has brought together their land use plan in 2018 and updated that. And of course, Johnson just completed the Thrive 2040. So that was a key part of everything we were trying to do. Again, remind you in that with this map, this is a, a map put together from multiple uh, comprehensive plans, but essentially uh, looking at all that area out there and really focus on the area in there, you, you see the, the, the two little 141 symbols there perhaps uh, looking between those of all that potential land that's uh, potential redevelopment with the golf course area and the land in there, as well as vacant land to the west of 141. So that was a key as we kind of zoom in on the corridor, but yet knowing there's just a lot of other opportunities still for the whole area and uh, everything in Dallas, Polk County and the other communities connecting to. Right. These are some volumes out there in the quarter, just to give you some context. Uh, 2019, you see the, the black numbers across the top. That's, that's average daily traffic out there going through the corridor. So you have traffic in this kind of 23,000 uh, range going through the corridor from one to the other. When you look below that, the blue numbers, you see those are the Des Moines area MPO all land use and demand goes into to the model that they have there and that's what it's forecasting out for about 30 years from now in the year 2050. So you see about a 50% growth in a, in a lot of it when upwards of 33 35,000 but what you see in the red numbers are what we came to which was numbers could be growing significantly based on all of this comprehensive land use plan potential. We don't really put a year on that because it's when does all the land fill in or does it ever completely fill in. But we wanted to put those values out there so that everybody could see those and realize what kind of potential the corridor actually has for traffic demand in it. It isn't just the, the land use uh, adjacent to it as well that contributes to that. Still factoring in a lot of other growth that could occur in the area uh, you know, and all the other communities growth and everything in the region. So again, there's a great potential for the corridor to you know, continue to grow rapidly. Mark, can you just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but no, go ahead. Can you put those numbers in sort of perspective? I mean, so when you look at 33,000, 35,000, what's another kind of similar road equivalent to that in the Des Moines metro? Well, just further south. I mean, just take 141 on down further south. When you get down around, uh, when you get right down near the I-3580 corner, I believe there's even in that stretch, even 40,000 in there. So, I mean, if that gives you a context of 
how much traffic. Now imagine just kind of pushing that northward. So uh, that would be a close example. Another would be Hickman Road, you know, out west of the interstate. You start to get uh, definitely have volumes in there that are thousand and above. So oh, I'm sorry, what? How they're much? definitely thirty thousand okay. and above out in that corridor. Thank you. Uh, crashes. This this small figure. This was fifteen uh, 2015 through 2019. But again, the uh, the dots in the corridor just represent where a lot of the crash activity is occurring. And of course, you see the clusters basically focused around the intersections. Um, that's where we have the greatest amount of activity going on. I don't think that surprises anyone. But again, it's still a it's of great importance to us when we evaluate the corridor and try to understand the type of safety improvements we should make. Go ahead. So, I mean, really. What we came out of these were some of the general findings in the initial part. Uh, on the safety side of things, fatalities, there have been a couple over the years, and unfortunately, I'm, I'm sure you had heard about them. Just in the past couple of weeks, there were, there were two more fatalities out there in the corridor. So safety is paramount in the mind of everybody involved in this, of what we're trying to do and make sure everything works. There's the demand to expand and grow, but yet we need to try to do that as safely as possible. So. Uh, you've also, through your comprehensive plans, you know, identified the parallel corridors to it with 141. So that's a great opportunity for us. And I think the biggest thing, again, I'll emphasize is that the corridor just has not reached the potential that it has. And that's why we're trying to get out in front of this. So all the recommendations for it, I'm going to bounce through these. Essentially, we've got a lot of different uh, locations all through it that we came up with. But the bottom there, you'll notice, um, Bottom line, maintaining some right in, right outs that are out there. There's two or three intersections that we could potentially close, but those will have access through other locations, kind of consolidation, if you will. And we'll talk about the adjacent roadway needs and even the potential for a new grade separated interchange further at the north end. Uh, a few of these aren't specifically in the Johnson City limits, but they certainly have context to what we're talking about. Uh, what you have in front of you right now is the area Menards is there to the left side of the screen, the very back side of it. Up there's Casey's and Quickstar that's being pointed to, so north's going off to the right. Uh, essentially, you see the roadway development on the east side of it. Why this is important in relation to the city of Johnson is on the north end of that corridor, Destination Drive, is, as Grimes tries to um, bring it through, would connect through and connect to Northwest 78th Avenue. So again, any development that would occur on 78, you know, further land development there to the north and back to the east, you know, would feed to this area and we want to make the maximum use out of the Beaverbrook signal that is out there on 141. Go ahead. So now zooming in a little more short term, what you're looking at is northeast 18th slash northwest 78th, just north of that signal. Uh, short term, if we continue to have some safety and really the big issue is severity. Uh, if people are getting hurt out there, there will need to be measures taken to look at, you know, do you take the crossover away and just the, take away the ability for people to try <laughs> to go across, turn left in front of high speed traffic, uh, things of that nature. So that's a short term. You also see in that light blue gray uh, long term right turn lane there. And what we talk about those, I'm going to say those over and over again, we call them positive offset where you shift the right turn lane over, give people the ability if you're sitting on the side road to see around the traffic coming at you and make better choices. Go ahead. A little more longer term for 78th is the idea that if indeed we get the, and it'll be more a question of when, we get the connections made with Destination Drive and through Beaverbrook up from Menards coming on up, is that you would close this intersection up. So again, we're putting the emphasis on Beaverbrook. We've already got a signal there for most of it. It would be adding to the signal on the east side and so flow out of this uh, west area of Johnston over there, you know, would come back this direction, work towards destination and up to Beaverbrook to get out onto 141. So 78th would really become a cul-de-sac uh, right there as it gets near 141. I uh, just wanted to mention there's a few driveways along there. Uh, as you start to go now from north of northwest 78th, you know, down, um, you drop down through the bridges that go over Little Beaver Creek. There's a few residences along there. Uh, we're not seeing the conflict and the problem with those. So as long as those stay how they are, you know, just maybe one residence for all the acreage or a couple, those will probably stay as they are. And just the DOT will look to do some things with kind of improving paved shoulders. So there's more of a deceleration 
not quite an official turn lane, but again, give people the ability to get out of the way, if you will, uh, as they're trying to turn in and out. So now we're moving up over, we've kind of crest over the, the next hill there at, at uh, Timberbrook up on top for that development out there. And again, on the short term, you know, positive offset right turn lane for traffic approaching Timberbrook or is going southbound. Uh, again, it just improves visibility and safety for people on Timberbrook trying to enter out onto the out onto the road. Go ahead. Timber Ridge, similar thing in the short term. You know, we'd look at one of these positive offset right turn lanes, uh, again, improving that visibility. But there will be some additional considerations for Timber Ridge as we talk about the other options. Go ahead. So when we look at Towner. Uh, at the corner of the golf course, uh, the intersection there. Through some prior studies uh, of 141, 415, uh, a few years ago up to the north, there was already an identification with Towner on the west side of possible closure. Probably the biggest issue associated with it is as you go to the top of the screen there, almost where the number nine is, you get up there, uh, the Beaver Creek is eroding into it. And so the county, there's great difficulties with uh, maintaining the road and keeping it there without some significant efforts to, to improve things. So that that's kind of out there. But as far as the other side with the residences, what we talk about short term, there would be some potential, another one of these positive offset right turn lanes, but also doing some things within the right of way we have out there to perhaps shift the intersection a little bit southward that again would improve some operations for people traveling south on 141, increase the left turn lanes very short coming across the bridges, improve their ability to get into a turn lane, slow down, and again, improve some sight distance as people sit on uh, towner and you know maybe looking back through the bridges, if you will. This is a short term improvement. Um, you can go ahead. This is another option that we had out there as a possibility again. A lot of these things, I failed to mention this at the beginning, there's so many of these things that are if development then. So a lot of these are, there, there are some short-term things that DOT can maybe do with maintenance work, but a lot of these will occur if there's redevelopment, greater traffic pressure, that's when you really need to think about these things. This is another example of Towner of shifting it further south. Uh, again, part of this relates to, there's been some discussion about that corner of the golf course, some potential for some development. You wouldn't just push the road right through there with the golf course as it is. This would be more a function of if something would occur with redevelopment in that corner, and there would be an opportunity to make this safer and better for everybody. And there could be more traffic pressure that would uh, occur with development of that corner. So that possibility. Those are some short term things I went through real quick in that area. Now I'm going to kind of talk about the bigger picture out in that whole area. Uh, what you'll notice here is you know you see these pink lines kind of some new roadways uh, if you could slide that down just a little bit there, there you go uh, 121st being up there on the top of the page if you will over on the grime side and the pink roadway you see aligning through is really an extension of 100th as it comes north when we get to the camp dodge property uh, maneuvering it along the south edge of the property and then continuing up through the golf course and eventually taking your cross beaver creek and you connect 110th court on the right side of the image there. The other talk is of a east-west, um, call it a major collector, minor arterial type street that would then run between 121st over across under 141 and over to this 100th, 110th connector. Uh, that would be the way to serve. Again, you have to look at that and right now you're seeing it on top of a golf course aerial, but you've got to envision that as that land changing completely with totally different development. That's what would uh, cause that type of consideration. So what you're seeing in the middle there, right at 141, yep, is the is an interchange uh, type facility is what we're looking at. Generally, given the lay of the land, it's somewhat conducive to taking the local road, the new local east-west road under, if you will, because it's a lot lower if you go out there and look at it. Uh, and 141 would be at somewhat like where it is, or we'd actually, you know, raise it a little bit as it comes through there to create bridges so that this local road would go under it. And the idea would be to create a grade separated intersection at the location, uh, because we just believe this is going to be the safest and most efficient way to, 
to handle traffic out there. If you go ahead, there's a zoomed in version. This shows you a little more detail of it. Again, you can see the ramps from kind of left to right on the screen there. They extend out to the south. They go just up past uh, Timber Ridge. And then to the north, they go just up across Beaver Creek. Uh, like any ramps, you know, there's room for acceleration. We're also dealing with some grade there as you go up, up the hill when you're going southbound. But uh, the idea we've, we've put out there is the concept is for what we call a tight urban diamond, which is a very compressed uh, interchange. So don't, don't think of it like you would something out here along I-3580 with a much bigger footprint. This is the idea to be a much more compressed because again, we're not dealing with the interstate corridor, we're just dealing with the Highway 141 corridor. Um, also, the goal behind that is to try to limit the right-of-way impacts on the adjacent developable ground next to it. So, again, the idea being at this point, generally, local road under 141, would, would the bridges would be put in there that would go over it. That's how you would set it up in kind of a diamond configuration. The last item um, to remind you of, this this area was a little more part of um, the prior study that occurred in 18, but the DOT asked, we mentioned this to you, is that uh, change the directionality of things here, but there's Beaver Creek. You can see kind of on the bottom of the screen right there in the middle and Towner. Uh, but the idea of these other little points in there limited to right in, right out, or there's, there's just kind of a median opening that's nothing's really connected. It would close by the interchange. But what you see in that left, um, rectangular image that's zoomed in is the interchange of the potential for that connectivity over to 121st as well. Uh, it would have to go across Beaver Creek, but this was discussed as a part of safety again, where you see in the upper left of that, you see 121st, you see those two little circles, those are like cul-de-sacs in a sense, that being severed uh, again because of the dangerous operation at the intersection and the safety problems there. This would give access. Uh, through that location. Uh, it would also serve, there's a subdivision out there that was built around that curve. And the other thing this uh, presents an opportunity for is th there was discussion about bicycle trail connectivity uh, out in the area. And so this provides an opportunity too of a trail connection more. It's how to get across 141 back and forth. And that's what this provides as well, uh, a corridor to put a bike trail in that then would be right next to the interchange and go across 141. Eventually that could work with other connectivity on up all the way to Beaver uh, or you know, eventually up in the northern parts to up towards Gesture Park. So there's a lot going on in there. Go ahead. Um, in the entire corridor, I think the other thing that goes without saying is that we recognize at some point six total lanes will be likely, you know, just like the widening of lanes five and six, not that long ago from down from the I-3580 corner, you know, on up to 44, we'll pretty much be faced with the similar thing. The next natural is from 44 right on up to 415. So it's probably not that far away, you know, it's just as warranted. Uh, monitoring speed limits through there. As you know, the corridor is designed, uh, it's designed four lane, I think it was about 1976 when it was constructed. And you know it's designed wide open. It, it's separated quite a bit, so it has a design speed uh, certainly that's up there higher. Uh, the idea being it's at 55, 65. Perhaps the opportunity to maybe look at it is just a 55 mile per hour corridor, but you get in that reality of what people are kind of willing to drive and comfortable to drive, given the nature of the corridor, the limited access and kind of wide open uh, versus what we post out there as a speed limit, and then enforcement. Is reality to that as well. Safety goes without saying monitoring that. Go ahead. Uh, so where we're at, um, these draft recommendations were made uh, in an initial draft report that came out in July. Uh, there were a couple of public meetings. We had one early on in May. Several of you were able to attend that. Then we had another one in August where we presented you know, these concept recommendations. They've kind of been collecting some public comments as we go. That's pretty much uh, slowed down, we haven't gotten any more. And we've been working on that relocated towner, that new interchange, if you will. We've been working on concepts related to that with the adjacent landowners and talking about development ideas and you know how to tweak it. And again, right now we're in such an early planning stage uh, of where it would be plus or minus a few hundred feet. But 
The DOT themselves also had uh, an internal project review meeting where they met with their project management team on October 1st and, you know, again, just discuss the ideas with the corridor and what's going on with it and, and what they want to continue to try to uh, maintain for mobility and, and safety and performance. Go ahead. So these, what's, what's left, the final steps, other than just, you know, uh, wrapping up the, the planning study and the report. Uh, the DOT it wants to come back based on the recommendations with an access control agreement to work with the agencies, uh, with Johnson, with Grimes, and with Polk County, you know, to help define these things. In the past, they haven't had those, and they found those work quite well to help your folks with development uh, and working with developers and understanding Here's what we're going to try to do with the corridor for everybody's benefit. Um, continue to work with the landowners, developers, um, talk about this relocated towner access, and then recognizing too, there could be phasing to some of these things. You know, you might not just get one, one location all at once. You might get one side of it, it kind of like Beaverbrook to the south, where one side of it happened at first, but ultimately it's going to have another side. Um, and then the department also talked about transportation that. Uh, some of those things like right turn lanes and things that still believe the need there, it isn't going to be replaced by something greater that we talked about in the long term, that they would do some of those right turn lanes and things as they rehabilitate the corridor with a, with a resurfacing project to improve it. So some of those things may happen just as a function of the department's work. So a lot went through there. Um, happy to try to answer any questions or, or if Dave can too and see, see what we can fill you in on. That's where we're at. Thank you, Mark. Does the council have any questions for Mark? Mark, uh, specifically when you talk about that relocated town or drive interchange in that tight diamond configuration, as it's depicted right now on that slide, would, would 141 be able to accommodate uh, six lanes? Yeah, there's probably some width in there. The, the median's wider. It all depends on how they'd finally do it and, and put it together. But that would be one of the points that we try to try to make sure that when we finalize some concepts that, yeah, you can get lanes five and six through there. I'm, I know that'd be in the DOT's mind. Yep. Uh, Mayor, I have a question. Okay. So um, again, at this same intersection, there has been discussion about development on the west side of the road that that is something that um, the developers looking to get moving quite quickly, but on the east side of the road, it's still a golf course. So uh, we were told the other day that possibly this could be a one, you know, we could build out to the west, um, but we wouldn't have to make that connection on the east side until needed. Is that possible, phased? Yeah, we've been talking about that. We, we think it's a reality of how things might occur. Okay. Uh, you know, so do you have to have it all at once? No, not necessarily. And that's some of the things we the DOT has reached out to us about. Maybe we need to take a next step forward and kind of talk about phasing something so that again, do you get the long term improvement you need? Try to spend the infrastructure dollars in the best way possible without throwing something away over time, if you will. Yep. And I really do appreciate your thoughts about getting bicycles across 141. And I would recommend that every time we do a build, we provide for pedestrian or bicycle at some point. And I, I focused on this uh, interchange there at 415, but certainly if you had an interchange there, a grade separated at relocated town or other places, yeah, there's other opportunities because really people crossing at grade with 141 is just not a good mix of, of pedestrians, bicyclists and, and vehicles. So anything we can do to go over under is going to be a good opportunity. So Mark there on, um, I'm looking at slide 17, um, this timber book, timber brook lane um, that goes there that, and then kind of it, it's on op lined up there. Would those both be right in, right out only, both the north side and the, I mean, the, the west side and the east side? Right. Um, Timber Brook, which is up at the top of the hill, so right there below the 141, perfect, you're pointing at it. Yeah, those, we've talked about those being able to probably be right in, right out. And then Timber Ridge, which is down the hill, um, going into the area, um, that would probably get, if an interchange with ramps were built, that might have to close because of, you know, it just isn't going to work with the ramps. 
Right. So, it, the, and the reason I, I know I've had some people who live in that neighborhood contact, you yep. know, they used to live in Johnson and they, I think they were sort of concerned about that, how this gets redeveloped. It, I think they would like this, the yeah. approach you've got here because it's, it, because it's, there's not a way to cut through their neighborhood. To, yeah. And to I would this. comment if you could, there you go. I, I don't have more map there to the West, but again, when you look at land to the West and additional areas and, getting traffic over here. One of the ideas behind this relocated road is to create more of, as I said, a major collector, minor arterial type street that, you know, it's more traffic than just what's in that development. And the other thing too, is the people in that Timber, um, timber Brook development, you know, you don't want to take the residential street and have that turning into more and more demand coming through there. Cause that certainly was never the intended purpose right. of the street. So, yeah, sometimes the closure and things can actually be beneficial long term if we put together the rest of the roadway network. And what's your, you mentioned you had two public meetings. Are those kind of done at this point? Or how, at what point do you envision sort of taking this document back to the public? Or how will that process work? I guess we, we presented the concepts. Not much has changed really from the last meeting we had in August. Um, just some tweaks to the positioning of that of that interchange, which again, that can still move a few hundred feet once you get into real design. So I don't think we've changed much more. So I don't know that there was any intent to have any further okay. public dialogue on it at this point, but you know, I'd yield to Jim or Dave if they have any other thoughts on that. All right, thanks. There, one more, uh, slide 19, back to the, I just wanted to clarify, there are the, on the left-hand side, that kind of enlarged you had indicated that those gray circles would, in essence, uh, indicate that those are now dead ends, right? You just close off those streets at those points? Yeah, the, the DOT is actually working on a project now. It came out of the 2018 study that some of the movements at 121st are being removed. I believe the north side is going to be removed, and they're still going to have some right in, right out, and maybe one left movement as an interim until other connectivity can be created. But yeah, that's being worked on as a safety project. And it also relates to the, the new corridor of 110th. You see it there in the middle of the screen where you're zoomed out more. That alignment isn't precisely right um, over a little farther. Uh, it's, but that is kind of that new roadway that would lead to that area. Again, we're trying to maximize the utilization of the 415 interchange, You know, use that as the interchange to then feed to the, the next street over to then let that street feed everybody up into the area. That 110th is also proposed then to continue southward to counter? Yeah, it, it exists as a roadway today down to, um, I think it's to row, it exists. And then, yeah, there's the other drawing. And then the idea would be, we'd create the connectivity on down across Beaver Creek and if the golf course would redevelop through there so that you know we end up with a that lesser level parallel you know, street to serve the land use and for the shorter trips versus going out on a 141. So Mark, on that, on that same page 19 or slide 19, you have the West connector and there's a, looks like there's a bridge there. Yeah. So who, who, who's pays for that? I, I think we're now outside the city limits of Johnston, right? Yeah. That, those I'm details, to, I know I, it's Anytime not, you've got a bridge, I get a little nervous. I mean, that, yeah. because that's, that's yep. a pretty, becomes a well, and I think um, careful here, promising anything on behalf of the DOT. But uh, I think the the key with that is it's kind of like the roadway with 110th course on the east side to the north of 415 that the DOT is looking investment in that because it helps protect with the safety at 121st. So I think if more things would occur with this interchange and this longer term vision, you know, there'd be elements there where they'd modify that interchange. And, uh, you know, there's possibility, I'm not sure how things would work out in actual partnering with the county, the DOT, everyone would be involved, whether it would strictly be the DOT, but. I'm, I'm, when you say everybody, as long as D, everybody is the county and DOT and not Johnson and Grimes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Granger maybe probably would be, you're getting close enough to Granger there too, that they would have to kick in. Mark, back on uh, Towner Drive. Um, you said that uh, the concept really hasn't changed since August. The the ultimate goal here is to probably put a, a tight inter, uh, diamond interchange there. Um, but I also heard you say that there's been more discussion around maybe a phasing approach, taking right. into consideration that 
you know, development is going to occur at different times, depending on, you know, the properties, the traffic volume will increase commensurate with, with that um, economic growth. Um, is the more phased approach going to be part of the report as well? Well, I think as we have further discussions on it, it's kind of bringing everybody together. I know that um, I know that Dave and I were talking and trying to get with Tony Gustafson at the DOT district to talk about those exact things because everything is such a you know, concept sketch is just like we're sketching ideas for the roadway. Uh, you know, I don't know that we have any hard and fast. We have development concepts, but somebody isn't ready to push dirt around and start, you know, building homes tomorrow or something like that. So. Well, we're just all, about. We're all <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but we're all trying to put things together to right. get a plan approach. Because again, part of it is we want to make sure we do the right things out of the shoot again for everybody's investment. And we agree with that. Completely. And the phasing, I think, could be key to this. Of yeah. can you build kind of a partial approach, knowing that well, you build a half, you build a half, and in the end, everybody. And we don't want to throw away. We want to make sure that it's you know incremental in the right direction so we can just build off of what's already already there but yeah we don't want you know we again i think we all believe that this is probably the ultimate goal for safety reasons and efficiency and everything else of the road um but we don't want you know this is probably 10 years out yeah could be yeah, yeah and I, in the meantime we don't want to stall economic development in that no. area so no, that's the difficulty we always have with uh, quarters like this and the intersections. It's always a challenge, kind yep. of, of the development coming first and the reaction to it of, oh, what do we need to build? And I think that's why this effort has been really good because we're trying to get out in front of some of these pieces and say, yep. safety and performance out there, what, what do we need to plan for sure. at least so that we create the right open area of land so we can do it? Very good. Any other questions for Mark? Thank you, Mark. Appreciate the update. The uh, next item on the agenda is to discuss zoning and subdivision regulation code. Revisions to zoning district dimensional standards. Uh, good evening. Um, as council is aware, we've been continuing. You can go to page four, Cindy. Um, we've been continuing to work on the update of our zoning code and um, the, count, the commission last Monday night spent, well, I don't know, almost two hours probably discussing it. Thanks to the mayor for attending and, and listening. Um, they've really, really rolled up their sleeves and working hard on this. And so I wanna make sure you're aware of the discussions they're having. And so I'm not gonna go through this whole presentation. Tonight. I wanna just touch on a few highlights. And real, real question I'm asking tonight is if you hear or see something in the information you have concerns about or, or questions about, raise those flags now so we can, we can keep working on that. And so the, the bulk of the work that's been going on uh, since the last update has really been looking at dimensional standards, so setbacks, minimum lot sizes, um, and those types of those types of things. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to highlight that's uh, that's new and different, um, and it, it shows up here on the on the sketch uh, that we've defined or are planning to define with this change is what we're calling the side corner yard setback. So uh, traditionally, a corner lot on a lot that's on the corner of two streets has two front yards. And we get a lot of variance requests for various things, fences and other things, because people use one of those side yards really as, or one of those front yards really as a side yard. You know, their house space is one street and their backyard and side yard really is on opposite side. And so we're defining that as the side corner yard setback. And you'll see as we go through this, that allows us to look at setbacks, that allows us to look at how we handle fences and those kind of things, because we're specifically calling out um, that, front, that, uh, that second front yard. And the front yard would be then where your front door is facing um, and that would, would, you know, we'd allow that flexibility in the code. Uh, you can slide ahead to seven, Cindy. And so one of the things, you know, we have, um, we have densities in our, in our comp plan that are, are sort of our, our goal densities. Uh, what we did here and what we would do going forward is really tie zoning districts to where, you know, R1-100, R175 really tie the suburban residential R1160, R2, or you know, more suburban mixed residential. Um, and so we're just highlighting that uh, that tie to the back to the comp plan, uh, comp plan here. That then leads into uh, page 10, I believe, uh, where we look at our um, lot dimensions for our residential districts. And what's on this screen is R160, R175, and R1100. 
what's shown in black is basically we're proposing to, to not have any in the, the left is our current, the right is our proposed, um, our current proposed. Everything shown in black is consistent or the same as what it is today. What's shown in red would be changes. Um, one of the things that we've, what we've tried to do and we talked about during the last update was really define housing types differently. So a duplex would be two units on one lot, a twin home would be two units on two lots. So they'd still be attached, but they'd have separate ownership. Um, and so that allows us to create different bulk regulations for those uses. And um, that we don't have that in our current code. And so you'll see, for example, a two unit duplex uh, that's horizontal, meaning side by side versus vertical, where they're one on the main level, one on the second level. Um, we're suggesting minimum lot width of 120 feet. If you go to the one below that, a twin home where it'd be on two lots, it's basically the same, 120 for two, but each one would be 60 and the same there for the, the minimum square footage. So we're trying to, in this case, we're just trying to, to build that table out a little bit more because we're defining uses differently. We can slide to the next. Uh, similar for R2, uh, the one thing that we um, are trying to do here um, is have a graduation in districts. And so our current R2 single family have the same bulk regulations as R160. So we've, we've made those a little bit smaller here in the R2 to have a graduation. So you'd have a little bit smaller lot in R2 and you'd gradually get larger as you work up through the residential uh, residential districts. And again, similar concept through the R, the two unit type uses that there'd be um, setbacks and, and widths there. So Dave, what, what's the difference between R160 and R2? It's really how many, what uses are allowed. So R160 would only allow a single family house, um, a duplex or a twin home. Um, when you get into R2, um, you can also do a three or four unit type of a product, a small townhouse, which I believe is four units or less attached. Um, all, all four attached. All four attached, okay. right. So the, the idea is as we, as you get, as you move into the more denser districts and you would be able to have more housing types, that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be some that overlap. So single family would be allowed in R2 and in R160, for example, just with slightly different standards. Um, same with the, the, two, the twin homes and the, um, and, the, and the duplexes, those minimum lot widths are slightly smaller in R2 than they are in R160, for example. Uh, page 12 there, we get into the R3. Um, one of the things that's our, our current, when you get into R3 and R4, which is our traditional townhome and is R3, R4 is traditional apartment district. Most of the bulk regulations are set up for the entire site. And then we have building separations and those types of things. We will still have that. What we're trying to do is establish um, if, if they're actually platted lots underneath each townhome unit, um, what are the what are the bulk densities? And that's what you're seeing in the red on the right. So that's why you're seeing such a, a broad change. The 200 minimum lot width and the 80,000 square foot in our current R3 is what the entire development would have a minimum of. And then you'd have little lots with inside inside of that. Um, Rita noted it. Uh, Rita with um, HKGI in her memo that was attached noted that the one thing that this does this table doesn't account for yet is many times a developer will postage stamp a lot around the foundation of a unit and everything else is an outline. Mm -hmm. So we'll account for that in the details of the of this. What this is showing right now is each unit, how wide each unit would need to be, or the lot underneath it would need to be, and how big that's that lot would need to be. And using those values, then we can we can get down to what if it's an outlot and uh, what those sort of perimeter minimums would need to be in those types of things. So that's why you're seeing such all red there. It's not as much of a change from what we're used to seeing. It's just the manner in which uh, we would regulate it. And if you go to page 13, Cindy, that's pretty much the same thing for R4. Um, the one thing I would note, uh, particularly in as it relates to minimum lot area, you know, we have minimum lot areas today, and the assumption is that you can you could go build whatever is allowed in that district if you meet the minimum lot square footage, and that's not necessarily the case. And so, nothing in these minimums would prevent the need for meeting parking requirements, and open space requirements, and landscaping requirements, all those things. You have to add all that together 
And that may mean that the minimum lot has to be bigger than what our actual codified minimum is. And so that's a clarification we'd like to make just because you know, you look at that and it's like, oh, we're we're going to a, proposing a thousand square feet per unit in a in a town home or excuse me, an apartment dwelling instead of eighty thousand square foot total. That doesn't mean we wouldn't have a larger lot there to support that. Uh, it just means that they still have to meet all those other requirements. So I like to make sure that that's pointed out and that's clear. So the eighty thousand requirements, those will those will no longer exist. Those would no longer exist, but we'd still have requirements for the whole site and what we've what we found in it you know ownership financing things change over time what we found is pretty much when you when a developer is developing an apartment building for an example they want separate ownership on each building for financing purposes and not the entire complex so you know before maybe the whole complex was built under one lot now they want individual ownership and so when you have the eight thousand square feet that may complicate that and if you look at bricktown um in the polk county assessor's site, you'll see these really goofy lot lines. They met all those requirements, but they did it by drawing lot lines through parking lots and open space and everything else. And, and you know, it'd be much simpler to have a more defined and you still make sure all that stuff is met on a common common outlot or whatever. So we're trying to make sure we're setting ourselves up that we don't have every development proposing a, a PUD based on financing or market uh, conditions. Uh, you, can, you can bounce down to 15, so thank you. Uh, so then we get into um, setbacks um, for what's shown here is R160, R175, and R1100. Again, really not much change. Um, the one thing that's that we are suggesting when you look at how our districts are set up today, rear yards generally match uh, front yard setbacks, except in R160. And so we are proposing a five yard reduction in the R1160. R160 uh, rear yard setback and then you'll see that proposed side corner lot that's that second front yard that i talked about uh, where we are suggesting a reduced ability to reduce that set, that setback on the one side of a front yard and if you go to green meadows north or green meadows west they're both set up that way they were done by pud basically with a 25 percent reduction to that to one front yard and that's what's uh, reflected here you can bounce to the next page thank you uh, this gets into R2, again, very uh, minimal changes, the, the uh, rear yard to reflect the front yard, um, and then showing that, um, showing that proposed side corner yard again. Uh, similar to R4, minimum, showing minimums uh, front and rear of 20, a little bit more flexibility there. And again, showing that um, uh, side corner yard. Any questions on on setbacks? I'm going to then skip ahead. There's a bunch of information on accessory dwelling units and cottage homes. Commission asked for more information on that, and so I will we'll we'll, we'll follow back up on that at a at a future meeting. Go to page 31. <clears throat> We also looked at non-residential districts. And so what's um, shown here is our, our C1 uh, through M districts. Um, we talked the last time about changing our PC or combining our PC and our CO. We're now calling that E1 um, employment. And we talked about making changes to our IC. We're now calling that E2. So a graduated uh, difference between sort of office employment, uh, light warehousing type of, we'd have a separation there between E1 and E2. Um, a couple of the, the PC in particular had a lot larger lot requirement and a lot wider width. What we're suggesting here is pretty much every um, commercial district would have a minimum lot width of 100 feet and 20,000 square feet. And again, not every use would be able to develop on a lot that size. They may need a, may require a larger lot. Bounce ahead to the next slide. Uh, actually, two slides, uh, page 33, um, where we look at setbacks. Um, not a lot of changes. Um, as far as setbacks go, the, the E1 and E2 are just because we're combining districts there. Um, one of the things that we had in our M district that we've carried forward in our C2, C3, E2 districts is that if there's a side yard abutting in a residential district, that would have an automatic 30 foot setback. And so that would, that would actually be an increase from our current, just reflecting that those uses should have a greater setback from residential districts. Um, 
Again, we have the corner side yard setback listed for all of those. Um, the other thing um, that would also be a little bit more restrictive is our, our current heights in our districts is pretty much 50 in all districts. And some districts are more apt to be next to a residential district, for example. And so what we thought was more appropriate is a transition of uh, when you start at C1 at 35 foot in height or three stories, and then work your way up as the uses intensify. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, Cindy. The other thing we're suggesting is that anything over three stories would have a required setback above that third story. So, and you can see in the graphic on the right there, those buildings, if they get taller than that third story would have to set back. So you're not looking at that straight vertical wall um, for, for buildings that would be taller. That would be a, a new change. So that would start on the third story, the that first two? Currently it's drafted at the third. This actually shows that after our, the way it's currently drafted is after the third. This graphic shows it after the second. After third. the second, okay. Yep, so that's certainly up for discussion if there's a, uh, we do have a little bit of that right now. We, and I think our C2 district would talk about if for every setback greater your setback from the minimum, you can add a foot in height. So there's some, there's some flexibility there. This gets, just takes a little bit, a little bit further. Uh, the next two slides really look at mixed use or, or, or two proposed mixed use districts. Um, uh, I will note that the what's proposed there really reflect the same uses in R3 and R4. So pretty much the same bulk requirements are carried forward. If you want to bounce to page 38, Cindy. Um, the one thing we are suggesting in our mixed use, remember our mixed use per our comp plan are supposed to be walkable, urban, um, you know, pedestrian friendly environments. And so we are suggesting that buildings would have to be pushed closer to the street. And as drafted, 50% of that building would need to basically be within a range of, a, of between, find it off the top of my head, uh, but be within a range of the front um, setback. So they, essentially what this would do is push the uh, parking lot to the rear or to one side. And again, that would get the building closer um, closer to the street, not unlike what we've done in the town center here. Um, and so that would be a new change, uh, but only in those mixed use, two mixed use districts. I'm gonna bounce all the way ahead to page 41 and summarize it here. Uh, our next step, and I noted this in the staff report in the packet as well, um, is to really dive into development standards where we look at open space buffer, landscaping, parking, stormwater, all those fun types of things. And we really, while they all stand on their own, we really need to look at them together because one affects the other and they all kind of work, and they all compete for the sort of the same space on a lot. Um, and so what we've suggested and what we had kind of planned as we uh, went into the process was to, to create a committee that could really dive into this. And we know there's a lot of interest um, from, a, from the landscaping perspective and, and the tree board and the commission have had previous conversations and so what we've suggested is creating a committee uh, that would be made up of planning and zoning commission, tree board members, um, mayor and members of the city council um, that could really dive in to these issues and sort of report out to both the commission and to the council. Um, our next joint meeting of the council and the commission is scheduled for January 24th. And so I, we're, we've got a schedule laid out that would allow this committee to meet twice before that. Uh, first week of January, the third week of January, I believe, around January 18th. And then um, that would allow us to report back to the joint meeting on the 24th, and there would probably be a follow-up meeting in early February. So I've got invitations out to the tree board and the commission uh, for volunteers on that. I'd, you don't have to tell me tonight, but I love their interest here. I sort of respected the... <laughs> Rhonda has interest. Um, I'd love to have two members of the council and if the mayor is interested and available as well. Um, our suggestion is that would be like at 3.30 in the afternoon. We'd do it by Zoom just because we're going to have a lot of folks involved and it'd just be easier to get everyone together. Um, and like I said, we're, we're, we're going to try to commit to only three meetings. Obviously, if we need to go more, we'll go more. But um, HKGI has been doing a really good job of keeping things moving along and, and making sure everyone's prepared when they come to the meetings. So. Uh, that's what we're looking at. If um, anyone else would like to volunteer, um, I would um, encourage that. Where we go from here, the PNZ is meeting the, we're taking December off from uh, any kind of significant discussion at their meetings, but they are having a 
this is on their agenda, the second meeting of every month. So end of January, end of February, end of March, end of April, end of May. Um, we are planning a, a, another joint meeting with the council and the commission on May 23rd, which is the fourth Monday of a five Monday month, just like January. And I suspect we may wanna do a joint meeting, the PNZ's last meeting in March. And I, these are all on the agenda. I'll get invitations out to everyone just so you have them on your calendar. Um, Say March? Of March, okay, March, just... March 28th. Okay. So that would be the commission's normal night to meet, but there's a long time between January and May and there's gonna be a lot of work happening. And I, as we've laid out the schedule, it just seems like you're, we need to have the, the, the two groups together for a, a, an opportunity somewhere in the middle, so. I didn't hear if she said March or yep. May. That was March and May is what we're looking, January, March and May is kind of our current schedule. And that, you know, there will be hip, hiccups and bumps and things might stretch out, but that really is the bulk of the heavy lifting of let's dive in, roll up our sleeves. And by that point after May, we should have a really good handle of what the ordinances might look like. That's the goal. And then we go through the education and adoption, all that fun stuff. But that's the that's where we're heading. I'm going to stop talking and ask if there's any questions or any other quick volunteers. questions. I'm going to try and get through one more item on the agenda if we can. Dave, the one thing that you didn't talk about tonight, but is that I think is sort of bizarre, is our C2 uses, our list of how you can you know C2, like for instance, ballrooms. Who's going to build a ballroom? Is it? I mean, I mean, it's sort of like this. Uh, thing, is, this this list seems to me to be really dated. Um, we're working on that. Okay, so is that something you guys are looking at? Okay, okay, okay. And I'm not sure what's the best way to solve. Well, it. we always joke about internally is if if you have a logical use that you come to ask us if it's allowed, we can't tell you because it's not listed. But if you have some obscure thing, it obviously right. yeah, matter of fact it, that will be is, in there. is that yes. list. It might be the most obscure list yes. ever invented. We're working on that. Okay, all right, yep. cool. Not to change the intent, but just to make it a lot easier to interpret. And, okay. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah. Mayor, the, the discussion for item C, the presentation takes about 15 minutes, and then that doesn't include comments or questions from the council. So probably don't have time to get into that one this evening. Um, may want to reschedule that for another time. Okay. So do we want to do D? We sh should be able to do D. Apologize. That item is um, is fairly critical to the police department's budget this year, and we just wanted to make sure we had enough Absolutely. plenty of time so to talk about it. Um, so, uh, in your board docs packet for this evening, good evening. I should have said, Mayor Council. <laughs> um, in your board packet, um, we have three PDF uh, documents for you. Uh, the biggest one is the entire budget PDF. It's called the distributed um, PDF budget. And Cindy was very helpful to me um, last week and has bookmarked all the pages for you. So if you open up the document and click open the bookmarks, you'll see she's opened it up on the screen here that there's the <clears throat> bookmark for the various departments and then bookmarks for the various decision packages as we go through um, discussion next Tuesday, a week from tomorrow. Um, Additionally, all the pages are numbered at the bottom, so when we tar start talking about something, you should be able to find the number at the bottom of the document as well. Um, these are the line item budgets themselves, which hopefully um, it's our goal, of course, that you uh, won't have to spend a lot of time going through those with us, to be honest with you. Um, first of all, we won't have enough time to do that. but. If something is glaring at you, uh, we certainly would like to know that. But for the most part, um, what's in the line item budget has been approved union um, wage increases and then our normal operating expense. Any new program, service, piece of equipment, anything like that is coming to you as a decision package that we've talked about. And then you've seen what those look like. There's the decision packages. Um, I have summarized those um in an excel document i guess i could have put that out there for you as well however what normally comes to you is the department director for that department has prioritized their decision packages as they present them to you 
when we come back in our January council meeting to work on the budget, Jim will have prioritized those as well for you to consider. By that point, we will have received evaluations. I did talk to the assessor's office, <clears throat> or auditor's office, excuse me, last week. Just wondering when I maybe could be getting a preliminary number. And um, they have new software and um, several people changed TIF districts. And the bottom line is I'm not going to have it. Um, I was hoping I'd have it by next Tuesday when I, we came to our work session, but they say it'll be highly unlikely that I have a, my first look at the number. But as soon as I get it, obviously I'll share that with you. Anyway, so those decision packages are for new, a new item, new service, new program, any new staff that um, they have requested. Uh, the Finance Council Committee has met with the departments and to get preliminary um, reports on the decision packages and the department directors took preliminary feedback and reaction. And you will notice uh, Finance Committee that some of the uh, decision packages that were presented to you during our committee meetings are not included in this final budget as presented to you tonight. So if you're wondering what happened, um, the department directors uh, took into account our feedback that they were given during those meetings as well. So I think it's laid out pretty clearly for you. Um, hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions you may have. The other documents that are um, in board docs for you. Uh, I always create uh, what are called budget program summaries. Um, uh, Brian, you may be the only one, I can't remember if you and I've talked about this, but our budgets, um, as we prepare them for the state, have to be uh, in program area. Um, public safety, public works, um, culture and recreation, community and economic development, we have to present them in a program area. So I prepare always a program summary. And what that is summary is telling you is, is, is not gospel. You couldn't take this to the bank, but it's a pretty, um, 10,000 foot level picture of what it looks like for an example, there's public safety. Oh, sorry, Cindy. You'll see what their expenditures cost us. You'll see what kind of revenue we actually get for that department. And then you'll um, kind of see what amount of property tax dollars it takes to run that program area. Um, it's not down to the penny because there's grants and things like that that come in, but that's the point of the program summaries that I do for you. You'll see if you would go to even community and economic development or even then the enterprise funds, uh, you should not be getting, having any amount necessary from property taxes to help support those particular areas. So there's summaries for all of the nine program areas required by the state. And then the other um, document that's included is the capital equipment plan. And the capital equipment plan is our depreciated um, e uh, equipment. And there's a five-year um, schedule included in here. We are moving this to our new software that we used for our CIP. Uh, we just haven't got that finalized yet. We just started that this fall. So you'll still, the, still see the same Excel spreadsheet of the items that are being replaced um, per fiscal year. Uh, that's the five-year, six-year summary of all departments. And then behind those summary sheets then is um, a financial reconciliation for the general fund and road use tax fund, which is combined because we transfer money from the road use tax fund to the general fund to buy all street equipment and any other general fund. You'll see a reconciliation for the general fund and the water and sewer funds and um, how we uh, accomplish our transfer and, and where those uh, equipment costs are paid for. So that's all um, for the budget tonight. Originally on your budget calendar, we were setting the public hearing tonight for the CIP. However, um, the uh, financial analysis was not quite finished for the CIP. So we are having it on the next council meeting, we will be setting the public hearing for the first meeting in January. So we're just back one week. We'll still be done prior to the council meeting. I haven't received any feedback from any of you regarding any, uh, any project questions that we had through all of our presentations, but 
that's where we're at with all of our budget work. Um, I'm currently working on our first budget amendment, which will also be in January. So any questions? That was a lot. Sorry, talked pretty fast. Questions for Teresa? Just a note to the council, we are going to start at 7 o'clock on December 14th rather than 530 uh, due to scheduling conflicts. So we will begin that meeting at 7 o'clock. So we've got a lot of work to do and probably two two plus hours, I guess. So we're, we're going to if we don't, we're going to try to get departments squeezed in our work sessions and things like that as we get as we move along. But um, if you see anything um, prior to the 14th or in between, please just fire off an email to me or call me and I'll do my best to get an answer for you instead of waiting. Thank you, Teresa. Okay, thank you. So Jim, do we want to, we're going to reschedule the uh, item C, the police canine program. Do we want to do the parks department budget after our regular meeting? We'll, we'll see how we're doing for time at the, reg at the end of the meeting. I would suggest waiting and doing it after. I mean, we have a lot of people here. Oh no, that's what I meant. I yeah. Mean, if we do it tonight, we'll do it after. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. okay. That was cool. okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It is seven o'clock, so we'll go go ahead and adjourn the uh, city council work session.